in the word of God. Prepare yourself for the feast of the word of God. As I know this passage, as I know this message, this sermon, prepare all of this for months, and we preach in Cambodian language this morning, I know that you will be blessed. That's a guarantee. That's a guarantee. So let us dive, in, dive into the blessing of God in the word of the Lord in Exodus chapter 12. And again, Exodus chapter 12, this passage is not a new passage to us. We had looked at it three times already last Sunday and two Fridays already. So we are familiar, very, very familiar with Exodus chapter 12. Therefore, today, I'm going to go only review a little bit over all the event that took place 3,000 years ago, a thousand years before Christ arrived on the scene on earth. But today we look into a deeper concept, the treasure that buried in this preaching and this teaching, not preaching, in this passage and this event of the Passover. Most people, whether you are Christian or not, the Passover is a familiar event historically and religiously to people, especially to those who are Judeo Christian, we know enough about the Passover. And another thing, if you are an American or live in America, born and raised or, or somewhat familiar with American culture, the Hollywood culture, we know the Passover means by the movie of the Exodus. Whether in the old version or the cartoon or the new version, I don't know what's what, uh, what out there, but I know that Hollywood have milk. <laughs> the book of Exodus is the, the Passover story, uh, and to what extent I don't know. But for you, for us, we have the word of God. Not only we understand the scripture historically, religiously, we will understand the depth, the center, the heartbeat of this passage, of this chapter, of this event. So let us review over Exodus chapter 12, 1 through 51 quickly. Again, this is only a review. If you feel like, wow, it seems so fast, it's not. This is only a review, main point from last week. That's all it is. And we've been together for, this is the fourth time already regarding studying, looking to the book of Exodus chapter 12 in detail. Therefore, this is only a review. So, from verse 1 through 14, God was calling out his people through his prophets by the name of Moses and Aaron to institute this feast called the Feast of Passover. And we understand all of the detail, you know, the tenth day of the first month, the month would be the Abib in Nisan, that's the name of the month for the Jewish people, the first month of the year. And you shall do this, you shall do that, get yourself a blemish, a no blemish, a perfect Sheep, I mean lamb. Keep in your household for four days and you kill it on the 14th day in the at twilight. And you know the story. Get the blood to paint around the door. So the night that the Lord strike the land of Egypt, he will pass over you. That's the story we know. And he command them, especially... Uh, in verse 14, he said, remember this. This day shall be your memorial day to you. And today should be the day that you keep for me as a feast. And that day, thirdly, you shall keep it as a law forever throughout your generation. So we know that. And 15 on to 20, 
the Lord instituted another feast next to the Passover called the unleavened bread. Seven days you shall not eat anything that has leaven in it. Purge out. And 21 all the way to 32 talk about how to prepare that Passover feast in the leavened bread. And 33, oh wait, sorry, 29 to 32, the execution strike, the judgment took place. Death came upon the firstborn of each house. From the king all the way to the slave, all the way to the criminal in the prison, from men to beast. So he did what he promised them. Execution took place. In 33 to 42, the exodus, the exit, the leaving of the land of Egypt. You saw that. And 43 down to 51 is a clear instruction, the institution of the Passover, the telling to understand last word to do this, and more detail and clarification, especially verse 43. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, this is a statute of the Passover. No foreigner shall eat of it. Wow, what's this mean? This is exclusively for you. Not like our generation of this time, especially we call seeker sensitive. We want everybody to come. We want everybody to be included. We want everybody for to join the church. So we have members, we have numbers, and we have offering of money, fame, whatever. In the minds of that, we want to give the gospel. I don't go against giving the gospel, but be clear. Giving the gospel to the sinner, accept the gospel, and join with us. Not to accept sinner, to come in and stay sinner. And to pollute the Lord's feast. No, no. Because down from 47 to 49 and so on, you see that. He said that a stranger, if a stranger would like to join you, would like to walk with you, would like to walk in your faith and, and associate with you, let them come in. But first, they must be circumcised. Back then, circumcised, just like we confess our faith now. As a Christian, we confess our faith in our heart. We believe God in our soul, and we confess with our mouth. We told everybody that we have given our faith, offer our faith, offer our soul, our soul to the Lord. And we offer, we on our own will, because we believe in the Lord already, not to say this, we become saved. No, no, we become saved already. We, on our own, ask to be baptized. The pastor of church, I would like to be baptized. I would like to confess my faith to the public that I am a Christian. And that is our time. But back then, they must be circumcised. Once they do that, they become native now. They become one of the family. And they shall keep, they shall keep that law as well. In 49, he said that there should be one law for the native and for the stranger. Now, everyone obey one law. That's the story of the Exodus, story of the Passover. And that very night, the very day the Lord brought, verse 51, the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt by their host. That's the story we all know. But today, by the grace of God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, and by the power of the Word of God, we will be blessed by getting 
to know him and his thought and the depth of the teaching even more. And that's a blessing. But there are something we need to understand. We need to get it square away because it's a fuzzy, unclear concern in here. Maybe some of you not aware of it, but I will make you aware of it in a moment. Some of you may have, because I've been mentioning it since last Sunday and last two Fridays already, and it's probably in your mind, but you've been praying and working, exciting research and study, you probably found the answer, probably not, but the thing is, in your heart, the joy to looking for the answer and the joy to find the answer. And today, we'll see that treasure that buried in this beautiful Word of God. That's one. Another one is that we notice that the Lord said, this is a Passover. Exodus chapter 12, verse 11. He said, it is the Lord's Passover. This is not a simple phrase. This is a, a statement to say that this is official. Something important to me, he said. For I pass over the land of Egypt, and of a strike will kill the firstborn from man to beast, from high to low. But for you, I will pass over because this is what I'm going to do for you. I will pass over you because I told you to do this, and now you are doing this. Take the blood to be a sign, not for me, but for you. See? A lot of times people think about the blood is a sign for God, for the angel to come and they see, oh, there's a blood on the door. I'm going to pass over. A lot of us have that mentality, but reality, they already know who's who. The Lord clearly, that's a lot of time, that's interesting, and most people overread this. The blood should, shall be a sign for the angel, for God. No, 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 for you, so that you know that I will pass over you because this is blood. Okay? When I strike the land of Egypt, that phrase tells us clearly. A lot of people read this when I strike the Egyptian. There are places God did say that he strike the Egyptian, but at this phrase, clearly I strike the land of Egypt. Where were the Israelites? They were in the land of Egypt. There's simple logical reasoning here. And it said, verse 14 especially, basically he said, you sh this shall be a memorial day to you. You shall keep this holiday, this feast, and you should keep this for me as a feast. For you, memorial, for me is a feast. Offer this to me as a deity, as God, the Lord, Jehovah. Number one, remember this day. Two, remember to offer to me as a feast. Three, remember, this is not only a feast, not only a holiday, not a memorial day. It is the law. It is the law. It is the law for you. Wow. Most of us didn't think it's the law. It is. Point number three, throughout your generation, not just you, throughout your generation, forever, forever, this shall be a statute forever. You shall keep it as a feast and a law and a memorial to you. Three points in here. But another angle I would like to show to you that the Lord command them to remember the three points forever, not to stop, not to stop. The question is, why? Nobody doing it. Wow. That's a really, really serious question, people. Think about it. Have you seen anybody sacrifice a lamb for Passover lately? Whether Jewish or non-Jewish, right? You say, oh, this is for Jewish people. I'm, I'm a Gentile. Uh, did we read that the Lord said, if a sojourner, if a stranger, if a foreigner want to join, let them give their faith to me and let them join? Think about that. This is not just for Israelite only for anybody who want to worship Jehovah God. Then again, not Jehovah's Witness. Two different things. This 
the Yahweh, the God of the Bible. So we have the concern here, why not we doing it? Have a Christian, oh wow, well, we believe in Jesus. Oh, well, that's good. Don't you believe in Jehovah God, the Yahweh God? Yeah, that's who. Well, Jesus paid it all. Jesus is done of this. I, I don't need to do it. Did Jesus say not to do it? There's no way in the Bible Jesus said to disobey the law of my father. No, 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 no. And this is clearly verse 14, verse 17, throughout your generation as a statue forever. The word forever means for and ever. Ever. What does it mean? It means every day after that day. There's another day after that day. If this is the day, it will be tomorrow. And tomorrow, forever doing this. Verse 24, you shall observe this right as a statue for you and your, not only for you, but also your sons and your children and grandchildren forever. So something that the Lord did not tell us to do sometime and stop. And us mean anybody who fear and believe in God. Uh, maybe you say, Pastor Adam, do you want us to become, uh, worship, worship God in the Old Testament, Judaism? We will see, should we do that or not? Or, or, or we need an altar here and we need to open this. Huh? <laughs> Brother Daniel, we have to open this if we were to do um, offering. We need a chimney or something, right? We're going to be smoke, a lot of things come up. Should we do that? It's going to be bloody all over the place. We don't know. Okay? But it seems like the Lord said, do not stop doing this. Okay? Maybe you said, oh, Jesus died on the cross, paid for everything. Okay, that's good. That's good. But where, how do we know that we're supposed to stop doing this? Okay, we shall see. 47. All the congregation of Israel shall keep it. Simple clear, precise command. <laughs> I love short command. Very, very precise. It's no negotiation. And 48, again, may I remind you, if any a stranger shall show, show, sojourn with you and would, would keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his male be circumcised. I thank God that we don't have to show our faith by being circumcised this day. Yeah, we circumcise in our heart. And we confess it with our mouth and with our baptism and our walk, daily walk. Then he may come near and keep it. He shall be, he shall be as a native of the land now. But no uncircumcised person shall eat of it. Clearly. And 49, he said that there shall be one law only to the native and for the stranger who sojourns among you. So clearly, God opened up for other people as well to come in to join this faith. But must be sincere and honest and volunteer on their own. But once you volunteer to follow the Lord, you must keep the law. So, oh, no, we don't, we don't obey the law anymore. Really? What is the law? What is the law, people? The law is a statement, structure, designed to be obedient. That's a law. That's a law. Though people break law, it doesn't mean we should break law, but people do, do break law. Two examples. Traffic law. The law said... Red says stop. Once you break that traffic law, consequence will follow you, or a black and white and a siren. Woo, woo, pull over, pull over to your right. Step out your vehicle. No, just kidding, not that far. If you don't want to stop, there will be a <laughs> chase. Breaking the law can bring you harm, can bring you punishment. Suggest, ticket, worse than that, accident, extreme case, you might kill someone, or someone might kill you, or two parties might die. 
So breaking the law is not something small, people. This is talk about traffic law. So well, I do it all the time. I didn't die. Nobody died. And I didn't get a ticket. Oh, don't worry. It's a matter of time. At the meantime, you should know that you are guilty already. Breaking the law, guilty. That example number one. Number two, gravity law. Gravity law designed to obey. Well, we all obey gravity law because we're not floating around. We pull to the ground. But this is what I mean by obeying gra gravity law. If you were on to 14th floor and you walk out the window, and you say, I defy the graphic, I mean, not graphic, the gravity law. I am just today choose to disobey graphic, uh, gravity law. The law of gravity, yes. Let me tell you the consequence. The consequence is you're going to be like a drop egg without protection. I saw my children make this science thing. They put a lot of things around the egg and they talk from the building. And so on. You know? Though the egg may be protected by cushion, but the idea is the egg hit the ground without any the egg would be a scrambled egg. The cushion get the hit. Either way, you go down. There's nobody can defy gravity, the law of gravity except Jesus Christ. When he took off to heaven in the book of Acts, I saw gravity law cut off. And he took off in the midst. His people, and one day you and I will be able to cut off gravity law as well when he calls us home. But anyway, come back here. The law is something for you to obey. To obey. All right? So we know Old Testament, good. For Jewish, good. How about for Jesus? Jesus fall into the Old Testament or New Testament or both? Well, let me tell you something. Jesus is very much a Jew. Jesus is very much a man, although he is 100% God. He is, and was, 100% man. There was no fake man. It was like pretending he was a real man. He was real God. Although he is God, he is a Jew. Therefore, he must fall under the law, everything. He created the law. He's the king of the universe. He's the creator. He's God. He's deity. He's the son of God. Still, he obeyed the law. That is how holy Jesus is. Now, a thousand years later, he show up on the scene in Israel, in Judea. And now it's about 12 years old, but scripture in the book of Luke, the book of Luke chapter 2, verse 40, talk about his childhood growing up as a person. And the child grew and became strong. He grew. He didn't skip because his God said, you know what, I'm going to just skip. I, I don't need to go to preschool, kindergarten, I just go to first grade. I might as well skip the whole thing. Or we'll go to where? Junior high, high school. No, skip everything. I just go to college. No, I don't need to go to college. I need to teach in college, which he did. He went to the number of stuff teaching at the age of 12. But the point is, people, he grew and became strong, filled with wisdom. He learned everything. Although he's God, he knew everything, but he set aside. He emptied himself. He grew up, learned how to use spoon and fork and whatever, you know, and obeyed parents and so on, brush his teeth and wash his face, whatever the Jewish boy did back then. And the favor of God was upon him. God was happy, and God poured his grace on his son growing up as a human being. So Jesus grew up as a Jewish boy, as a boy, as a human being. Every year since ever he remembered, he remembered the Passover feast. He remembered the lamb in the house. He remembered the four days of petting this beautiful, innocent pet. Only find out four days later, this is no longer a pet. It's a sacrificed animal that died, blood gushed all over the place, and the whole house smelled like barbecue. Roasted 
His Can you imagine in a mind of a child, a mind of a person, you and I know that, you know, he probably named him Jojo. Jojo, Joshua. <laughs> Joshua! Joshua, where's Joshua, mommy? Oh, Joshua died. Oh, what happened? And we just cut the throat. Oh, why? Well, this is a commandment. It's the law that we have to cut the throat of this Jojo. <laughs> you know? He must have been... What, you know? He has compassion. If anything you know about Jesus, Jesus has compassion. A righteous man has compassion even to his animal. The Bible said that. This is not just any animal. It's his pet, precious, no blemish, one-year-old lamb. Jesus saw that all the time throughout his growing up as a boy. 41, now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of Passover. Jesus observed it all along. Jewish culture. Big time. Big time. So Jesus came to earth, obeyed the Passover law. I'm sure he enjoyed being a Jew and so on and so on. I, I don't have time to elaborate. It's 12 o'clock already now. Our time, California time. If I have about two more hours to preach, I will tell you the detail of what, how he, and everything, Jewish cultures, and so on. But 30 years later, now he's about 30 years, Jesus show up on the scene of ministry. He say goodbye to his parents, actually only... 29, not 34, I make that mistake. John 1, 29, he left home. Now he came to serve the Lord in his ministry. The very first day that he showed himself in the public in Jordan River, where John the Baptist was doing his ministry by baptizing people, called them to repent. The first day, the very first day he showed up, John the Baptist proclaimed, prophesied and proclaimed by the power of the Holy Spirit. Say, behold, the Lamb of God. Look, that is the Lamb of God. Thousands of years that we killed lamb to save, to, to sacrifice the blood in our behalf of our sin. That is the Lamb, the Lamb of God. And you say, oh, Lamb of God, along the way, right? This is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He here to take away our sin, people. And Jesus knew, knew. Now he's no longer just growing up. He learned everything as a human being, but he is also God now. He starts to use his divine nature here and there, and he starts to perform miracles and so on, and ultimately he shows himself God. In the transfiguration moment up in the mountain, we saw that already, and also the resurrection. Fully God, but still fully man. But now Jesus knew that he is a lamb of God. He can predict three more Passover feasts. Three more, three more, he will be that Lamb of God in actuality. Yes. Three years later, he's now 33 years old. The very last, last Passover he ever, ever celebrated with his people. That night. That night in which he was betrayed. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11. The Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread and broke and he said that this is my body which broken for you. And he said, do this now. Now do this commandment. Do this in remembrance of me. He didn't say now. Remember the lamb that uh, Passover lamb killed the lamb. Do that. No, he didn't say anything. He didn't say stop doing that either. But he did say something clearly. This is a new command. Instead of a lamb, it's me now. 
And then he took the cup the same way. He said, this cup is a new covenant. New. Which later on we will see it will replace the old. He did replace the old. Did he violate the old? Or did he fulfill the old? Should we continue to do the old law or mission? What is it? We do we don't. Obey Jesus or obey the Father? Jesus and the Father is one. So they shouldn't contradict each other. Wow. That's a beautiful investigation. This is a new covenant in my blood. Do this to remember me. And say, do this until, do this to proclaim my death until I come back. Until forever. Until he come back. And we go to heaven, we still worship God, remember Jesus died on the cross. We still do that. In the book of Revelation, we saw, behold, the lamb was slain that rose again. So, we, we, we should question, if you're not, I'm helping you to question. When Exodus chapter 12, verse 11, the Lord said, this is my Passover. This is the Lord's Passover. And verse 14, you do this to remember this for yourself. And you do it to worship me. And you do this as a law. You keep forever. Verse 17, do it throughout your generation. Verse 24, just do it. Forever, you and your son, verse 42, keep it. Throughout the generation, verse 47, do it, period. Do it, period. Verse 48, it's a stranger. Come in, if a stranger, come in. <laughs> let him come in and let him be circumcised first. 48. I'm not telling you to circumcise. Because you just come in and say, sir, you come in, let him be circumcised. Oh, really? <laughs> no. <laughs> Anybody, verse 48. Come in, join, let him be circumcised first. And let him keep, let him, he shall keep, and he shall be the one among you now. And 49, it shall be one law for the native or stranger. So we know clearly that God command his people to keep the law. And Jesus came on scene, you saw what happened. It's almost looked like a contradiction, a conflict between the Father and the Son. No, no. Because he clearly proclaimed, he explained it to people. People, listen, he said. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I'm not here to abolish. I'm not here to go against. But I have come... I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Jesus here to fulfill the law. If anything at all, he is to fulfill, to uphold, to honor the law. And he said, for truly I say unto you, until heavens and earth pass away, not an iota or a dot. Iota, dot is a little, you know. Mark on those Greek words to change the sound, the definition, the meaning. So he said, not even a little tiny dot or comma or period will pass from the law until it's all accomplished. He said, I will accomplish everything. I'm not here to destroy. Therefore, we know Jesus would not do that and he would not teach us or lead us to disobey the law. The question is, how come we're not doing it? I haven't seen anyone, whether Jews or Gentile or Christian, uh, sacrifice the lamb lately. No. Not the way God subscribed. We do barbecue here and there, but there's nothing close to sacrifice the lamb. No. And Jesus went on to say in John chapter 10, verse 35, part B, he said, Scripture cannot be broken. Scripture cannot be broken. It must continue. Psalm 119, verse 89. Forever, O Lord, forever your word is firmly fixed in heaven. Three words related to the word of God. Number one, forever. Number two, firmly. Number three, fixed. For, forever firmly fixed. Oh, boy. Those three words clearly express the totality and eternality and purity 
of the word of God, nothing can abolish, nothing can touch. And fourth word, in heaven. I mean, no way anybody can go and alter or abolish or touch it. You must obey only. Jesus said this in Luke 16, 17, it is easier. It is easier for the heavens and the earth pass away. But it's easier than one dot of the law become void. No, not even a dot become void. It's easier for heaven and earth destroyed, but not the law of God. As a matter of fact, Matthew chapter 24, 35, not only easier, but he definitely, the earth and the heaven will pass away. Is it not? Earlier, you get the concept, it's easier for this than the, world, the law of God being painted or altered. But now is it the earth and the heaven will pass away or be destroyed or renew or just take away. But, but my words will not, see it's all will, will not, definite, future, strong. My word will not pass away. The word of God will stay. So what will God say in Exodus chapter 12 must mean what it means. We need to understand. To understand, we need to go to the depth of the real reason behind the blood of the lamb on the doorpost. The reason, the meaning, the treasure, the in-depth, the mystery, and the Passover feast. Exodus chapter 12 again, and let me remind you, it is the Lord's Passover 14. You do it forever, you and your generation 24, you and your son forever 48. You and the stranger, if they want to become, but no uncircumcised person should eat of it. 49, just remind you, one law, everybody must obey. Not that, okay, if you're American, you stop, and you're Asian, you just, you see yellow and red, just go faster. <laughs> No, one law for, uh, for whether white or black or blue or green or purple, whatever. And before I heard this, when people pass over and people boast about this, they said, when the police caught you, caught you, and you say, I, I, I know speak English. <laughs> well, speak English or not, you break the law, you break the law. It's okay. You can go to court and have interpreter to tell you how much you need to pay. <laughs> okay, law is law. Let me reveal something from the scripture which bless your heart and my heart too. As much as a study prepared, I was so excited this morning and I'm going to be very happy and blessed again when I share this with you. The depth, the reason, the core reason of the Passover feast or activity. Why? A lot of people say this. A lot of people think God passed over Israelite and strike Egyptian. True, but a lot deeper than that. They read it as, as if Israelites are pure and holy and sinless people and Egyptians are sinful and uh, suppressive and this and that. And kill them. A lot deeper than that. Prophet Ezekiel explained the sacrificial right and reason a lot clearer later on when the Israelites learn more about sacrificial act and feast and law. And now, granted, the Israelites, when they first start to have this Passover feast, they were individually in a family and small unit. But now, Later on, when they established, it's no longer just each family is doing it. It's become national, national feast, national celebration, and national worship. They come to the temple now. And later on, after the 70 AD, they're no longer in the temple, and they went back to family again. It's full cycle. But there's a reason behind that. Ezekiel 45, verse 18. You remember the Passover, right? The first month of the year, the 10th day, bring the lamb, the 14th day, celebrate. Now we go to the same first month, 
in the first month on the very first day of that month. Whoa. Instead of 14, we go to the first day. You shall take a bowl from the herb without blemish. Same idea. Purify the sanctuary. 19, the priest shall take some of the blood of Take some of the blood of the sin offering. Oh, so the blood sacrificial ceremony here is for the sin offering. That tells me, tells you as well, this blood that paint on the door was not that they were pure. Basically, they were sinful as the Egyptian was sinful too. But instead of Paying with their own life, an innocent blood spilled for them because it is sin offering. Whoa, now we understand the concept behind that is not that they, they were any better. Like us, Christians, we are no any better. We are not no. We are not any better than anybody else. We are sinful people except two things. The Lord have graciously saved us from sin and its consequent hell and death. He saved us by paying a full price. And number two, those who got saved, those who believe in the Lord God Jesus, a Savior and Lord, will naturally, some faster than another, but eventually they all obey and love him. They change their life. The life-changing transformation. But go back here. You understand the concept of the, uh, the, the Christian faith now. Go back here. We see clearly that the blood that pain on the door is for the sin offering. Not because they're pure or they're good people, better people. No, 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 no. Because they sin. God judged sin by death in the land of Egypt. And you too. God judged your sin too. But you didn't pay for it. Somebody else, a little lamb. That's what it is. That's a real concept behind that. But now instead of put on front uh, on your door, put it on the doorpost of the temple because they all come and worship God nationally now. Oh, I study the the right the, the tradition how they kill the lamb, how they pass to line, how they pass the the basin of the blood, and they put some on the door, and they pour and become a crimson creek flowing down the hill. You can see miles away red line from the temple. Anyway, I, I refrain myself not to go there because we don't have much time. That's the first day. And the seventh day, a week later, whoa, not only the 14th, but the first day and not the seventh day, do the same thing. You do the same on the seventh day, mean blood sacrifice again, for the sin again. For anyone who sin through error, I mean you make mistake, you sin willfully, or this word is interesting, or you sin ignorantly. You're ignorant about your sin, you in an unintentionally sin, but you sin. What does that mean? It means whether you know it or not, you need to offer. And you're a sinner. You know you're a sinner. You didn't mean to, but you still need to pay for your sin. Instead of your life, you bring an animal, an innocent animal, someone. Because God is not an unjust God to let you go to heaven free. That would mean he violated his law. He contradicts himself. No. He said law is a law. You sin, you pay for it whether with your life or someone's life. And you say, I'm glad. <laughs> Thank you, I offer my sister. <laughs> I offer my husband. <laughs> no, 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 no. You, it's cost you. Cost you. You say, wow. Is that, we're going to take the blood and we offer a little bit and we keep the rest for barbecue? No. Whoa. How about money? Exactly. You need to be, number one, careful about your money, how you spend your money. That's why Jewish people generally are rich, because they're very smart and they're very careful with the money. We should do the same. It's a good thing. 
And number two, whatever you do, you must offer to the Lord, not that day only, but every day save up your money in order for you to get a full animal to offer to the Lord. That's a worship lifestyle. Sincere, but of course, they pollute it. So, the seven days you should do the same, and verse 21 to 14 day you should do the Passover. We understand that. And the eleven. The unleavened bread. Verse 22 explains everything now to support my theory. On that day, that what day? Refer to the close proximity, the 14th day, which is the Passover, or on that day. Because this day is the same as the seven, seven is the same as the first one, first one is the same as the seven, seven is the same as the 14th. Therefore, all of them, on that day, whatever day you're talking about, on that day that refer to the 14th, fine, which is good, Passover. My point, on that day, it's a day that you should sacrifice the blood of this animal for a sin offering. See that, the last phrase, for a sin offering. At this place, God commands the prince to offer this to people. Well, you now, a leader, <laughs> you offer all this for people. Whoa, talking about spending the national budget here. You better be wise throughout the year. Yet. On the seventh day of the festival shall provide a burnt offering to the Lord, seven young bulls, seven rams, who without blemishes more people. On each of the seven days, a male go daily. For what? For sin offering. I know you by now you know all those offerings of the blood sacrifice. Kill an animal, and it's for sin offering for our sin. Hmm. Twenty-five. In the seventh month, oh, first month, now seventh month. On the fourteen, fifteen day of the seventh month, you should do the same provision for sin offering. Sin offering is throughout Jewish culture concept. Faith, belief, and daily living. From saving money to get that for the first month of whatever, seven months, first day, second day, first day, seven day, 14 day, every day, whatever day is. And when you sin outside of those days, you need to bring a sacrificial animal to pay for your sin. You understand that? Sin is serious to God, and sin, God command payment for sin. Wow. It's not that Jewish or Israelite better than Egyptian. No, not that we better than non-believer. We are no better. The only thing is our sin was paid off. But do you get to pay for your sin? A penny for your sin? I guess not. If you did, you didn't pay for it. If you did, you defiled the blood of the Lamb of God. Hebrew 9.22, without... The shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Without shedding the blood, God said, with no shedding the blood, there's no forgiveness. Some of us take Christianity as a joke. Some of us go to church because you have free time. Some of us go to church because you kind of like to want to go to church. Some of you go to church because you want something from church people. No, no. No, no. Serious about paying for your sin. And God pay for your sin. Because you live on sinning, you born sinners, and you live as a sinner, and you willfully or ignorantly sin. The result of your sin and my sin, our sin, according to Romans 6.23, is death. What we earn from sinning every day, from nature to nurture to will to not, we get paid a big check at the end. The wage of our sin is death. We die. Die not only physical, but spiritual second death. Second death. In Ezekiel 18.4, the soul who sins will die. The soul who sins will die. 
And I said, well, I, I know so and so. Somebody boasted, I, I'm, I'm not a sinner. I never kill anybody. They start off, I never kill anybody. I never rob a bank. I never rape anybody. Or I never even said it. Or I never thought of it. I never lie. And then they're lying while well, they say they never thought of it. Already incriminate them to be a sinner. Deserve the weight of sin is death. You shall die. Whether you think about it, you say it, or you do it. But let's say, let's say, for the sake of argument or, or debate, let's say individual or group of people totally, totally righteous, human level. Isaiah 64, 6 said, your righteousness becomes a polluted garment to God. It doesn't matter how pure you are, your thing or you do, your level of righteousness is polluted to God because you're tainted by nature. But in reality, no one thing purely all their life. And someone say, I, I, I think most time purely. That's good enough. And Proverbs 11, 21 say, be assured, be assured, an evil person will not go unpunished. But the offspring of the righteous will be delivered. Be assured. Sinner will not go unpunished. It's a matter sooner or later. Kid, it's a matter sooner or later. You get caught. And you get punished. And he said, that's talk about evil person. I'm not evil. Wow. The word evil here means from evil to the degree to evil by nature, thought, or word. All of us fall into sin category according to Rome chapter 3. Both Jews and Gentiles are under sin. Everyone. No one is righteous. No one. Not talk about evil criminal, the rapists, the murderers, and the robbers. No, we talk about everyone evil. None is righteous. Romans chapter 3, verse 10. None is righteous. No, not one. I mean, all of us. No one understands. That's why we say people who don't understand, they think they're righteous. When people come up to me and say, you know what? I'll tell you the truth. I'm righteous. Everything God say about good people, that's me. Scary. Because you don't understand. So what's it mean? Then the Bible teaches to do this. Now I do this. Does that mean I'm wrong? What does that mean? No, no, no. Talk about your nature, talk about your obedience, talk about your trust in someone righteous on your righteous. Talk about who's God, who's your Savior. Is that you or Jesus? No one understands. That's why you don't understand. Altogether, no one seeks God. They don't seek God. They seek themselves. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Not even one. Why? Because there's no fear in their eyes. They say, I have no fear to God. No fear of God. They, they have no respect. No fear. No comprende. They don't understand. They don't understand how serious God is, how serious their sin is. They don't understand that. Romans 3.23, all have sinned. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Again, Remind you, 3.10, Romans 3.10. None is righteous, no, not one. Isaiah 45, if you have time to read Isaiah 45, 18 to 23. Beautiful, how powerful, how majestic, how holy God is. How righteous God is. Only one righteous, no, not one. None of us is righteous, but God is righteous. But it says, verse 21, I, the Lord, and there's no God beside me. None righteous, only me is righteous. God is righteous. And the righteousness of God, the nature of God who is righteous, never failed to be a savior. Amazing, beautiful phrase. You should note. A righteous God and a savior. God cannot be a savior is a righteous God because righteous God, righteous nature has this righteous, kind, gracious, merciful to save. Yes, the righteous God must punish sin because he's holy. He punishes sin. He does the right thing. But righteous God also, a God that saves. 
He is a righteous God, and He is a Savior God. There's none beside Him. So we understand. He hates sin, He saved. He punished, but He saved. Because He's righteous, but He's Savior. Yes. If we all sin, Jews and Gentiles, Egyptian or Israelite, all sinners. They all should die. But because he is righteous, he executes sin, he also saved. How did he save? Right? I just ignore the law, breaking the law. That means he's not righteous. He's not justice. He breaks his own law. He contradicts himself. Or oh, Jesus contradicts God. No, he did pay it in full price. That's why a blood spill since that very day. Talk about since the very first day that Adam and Eve sinned. We, we talked about that before. You know, Adam and Eve didn't just get a, just some leather jacket to put on. God said, oh, I'll make you the leather <laughs> outfit today. Whatever, you know, Wilson, Holly Davidson, whatever style. <laughs> but a life was sacrificed in your behalf. God command and demand payment for sin. He's a righteous, at the same time, he's a savior. And Psalm 116.5 clearly talks about this righteous God. See, sandwiched with the word righteous here, he is a gracious God. He's also a merciful God. Gracious is the Lord and righteous our God is merciful. Gracious, merciful, put together, honor this person who is righteous. Beautiful. Beautiful concept, people, because the righteousness of God now revealed in New Testament, from Old Testament too, but clear now in the Roman, in the book of Romans, chapter 3, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. Oh, beautiful people. You and I know that we cannot ever pay for our sin. What are we going to do? We're going to die, go to hell. That's all it is, all you can do. But now, this righteous God has freely given his own righteousness, share his righteousness to those who believe through the faith, through faith in Jesus Christ. Because we all now clearly say that none of you, none of us is righteous. We all sin. We have sin. But verse 24, we are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Jesus paid for it. Whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show, this was to show God righteousness. He showed his righteousness by paying in full. He's not cheating. Because of his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sin. Oh, beautiful. He passed over sin. He did not pass over. He passed over sin that had been paid for. He did not just pass over because you're good. Israelite was not good. You know the story. <laughs> when they get out, they express they're not good. For sure. God had passed over former sins. Beloved, you and me, a sinner, we are by the grace of God, His righteousness, He give us, not only forgiveness, He give us His righteousness through faith in Jesus Christ. And should we continue to go on sinning? For you to think. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and justified. He is just. God is just. And the justifier, he justified all of us, the one who has faith in Jesus Christ. This is amazing. So what should we do then? Should we do away the Old Testament or the law? Verse 31. Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? Now that we have faith, we forget the law? No, by no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. We uphold the law. How can we do that? 
Well, we saw that it was a gift. The gift in having faith in this person, Jesus Christ, as John said, Behold the Lamb of God in John 1, 29. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away your sin, my sin. Behold, look, you have faith. You look at him, you adore him, you worship him, you thank him, you love him, you follow him, you obey him. He's not only the Lamb of God, people. Verse 34, he also the Son of God. He is the perfect Lamb of God. He's pure because he is the Son of God. For the wage of sin is death. We know that. Romans 6, 23. But the free gift of God is eternal life. Free gift of God is eternal life. But not without a cost in the blood of Jesus Christ, in Christ Jesus. That is why John 19.30, after being beat up to a pulp, black and blue and, ble and bleeding and all kind of stuff, and they torture him and they crucify him the last, last, last minute. He was dehydrated. He lost a lot of blood. The throat is dried up and, and, and the wind blew and... And the pain and the insect and the flies and this thing come and pick on his wound and the blood. It's just like he was stuck on a cross, uncomfortable, and con uncomfortable, cannot breathe, cannot release himself because it's like all stuck like that. If he did something too strong, too hard, will rip through. And it's just so, so difficult, painful. Not to think about, not to talk about the, the separation between the Father and Him for three hours. And now He, very thirsty. He said, I'm thirsty. Of course, you know, you, you kill a person, you torture a person, at least be gracious is enough to give him some drops of water to cool his tongue and his throat. And you know what they did? Mocking Him, they gave Him sour wine, vinegar. Can you imagine thirsty run, you know, those of you who play sport or you're silly or whatever you do in a hot summer and you come home, oh, Mommy, I'm tired, I'm thirsty. Or oh, you saw a cup in a kitchen, you rush in a cold water, you just pick up and, oh, vinegar. And you got mad at your mom. And you make cuss or something, you know. Oh, well, that's a different story after that. Hopefully you're not my children. <laughs> Jesus took, they offer him this. What well, was so thirsty to death? He's dying, literally to death. They give him sour wine. One, two. Can you imagine? Have you ever had cold sore or cut on the lips or something? You eat something spicy or sour or hot. Ooh. Jesus have all over his face. He got punched, he got pulled, he beat all over the place, and they put sour. Um, Wine, not just like, like this. They put in a sponge and they push in his face. Like that. He took a... Uh, can you imagine? Painful to the last second. And he said this. After that, he said, it is finished. Not like, I'm done with you. No, not that. You give me some wine, I'm done with you. No, not, I, it's finished. I don't want this anymore. <laughs> not that. He said, it is finished. I pay in full, Lord God, Father. It is Finish to offer this pure Lamb of God as a sacrificial act to the Lord to worship God who hates sin and to you who are sinner chosen by God to be free, you from now on free from sin because it is finished. He paid for your sin and my sin. We are free. And then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. I mean, he died. He died shamefully, painfully to pay for your sin and my sin and to complete, to finish, to accomplish every law that God commands sinner to do. If you, at this point, sinner, don't have any desire to worship Jesus, to thank Jesus, to love Jesus, to obey him, I don't think you have any chance at all. Well, unless God changes you in the future, but right now, if something happens, you go to hell. 
I'm not cussing at you, okay? I'm telling you that you are going to hell. But if you change your mind right now, before your last breath ever happened to you today, if this is the case, you will be in heaven because Jesus finished paying for your sin already. This is a story to pass over, that Jesus saved sinners. You say, oh, Jesus saved sinners in the New Testament, but the Old Testament, God, God the Father, um, Jehovah saved the Israelites. No, 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 no. God is only one God, although two persons in this one God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, they're all in one God doing the same thing. They don't contradict themselves. They do the same thing, the same, the same thing. I would like to conclude in the book of Jude. Chapter 1, <laughs> one chapter, verse 3. We talk about a common salvation, the salvation that falls on all of us whether Jew or Gentile, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to content you, content for the faith that was once was all delivered to the saint. All of us call the saint now holy now because the faith was given to us, the salvation was given to us. Now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that, that, listen to this amazing Amazing, I love this treasure, that Jesus who saved our people out of the land of Egypt. Really? Jesus is the one who saved them? Definitely, absolutely, not just the Father. Jesus himself saved those Israelites from the land of Egypt. God, the righteous God, God the Savior, Jesus the Savior, Jesus God. Oh, some, some, some people come on, knock on the door and say, Jesus is a perfect man, he's no God. Really, God's a righteous God, God's a savior, God saved Egyptian, and right here, Jesus saved, I'm sorry, Israelite from the land of Egypt, pardon me, and now Jesus here clearly, scripture here says Jesus saved a people out of the land of Egypt. To me, I was like, whoa, beautiful, amen. I jump out of my chair and run around the house and came back and study again. And I run around and clip tree. <laughs> clip, 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 clip. <laughs> my children and my family know that. Daddy's study, how come he's outside? Not that I'm so enamored with tree. I do, I like tree, but I think of things that were so beautiful, amazing. Treasure, people. I love it. I'm glad you love it too. Yeah, it's not exciting to you in your face. Yes, thank you. You know, some pastor, amen, amen, amen. <laughs> Back for amen. Back for clap. Yeah. I saw pastor, amen, and clap on the. So sad, so sad. Anyway, uh, that's a side point. But I am excited. Pastor Dave jumped up and down, look at him. Uh, <laughs> I'm just, he's happy. We, you guys, happy. I'm so happy that we find out Jesus is God. <laughs> Jesus is not only Savior, but He's God, people. He, I'm an I, Clearly that the Passover is about paying for sin of sinner, for price. Before it was a symbol, but now actuality, the Lamb of God paid for our sin. Whew. Afterward, destroy those who did not believe. And at this part, most people don't want to say it because it's not seeker sensitive. You don't want to say God destroyed. Jesus who saved the Egyptian as God who saved the Egyptian. I'm, I'm sorry, I keep saying Egyptian. I, maybe something with me want to help uh, share the gospel with the Egyptian. Jesus who saved people, the Israelite from the land of Egypt, is the same as the God, the Father, who saved the Israelite from the land of Egypt. And the same God, now the same God destroyed those who did not believe. That means Jesus also will destroy those who didn't believe. So they both saved, they both destroyed. That's beautiful in the deity of Jesus Christ, in the unity of God, and also another word is that, another point that I want to point out that God is not just God who, uh, who, who wins to go save people and please come to church, come as you are. Here I am. <laughs> no, you come, you change. You're just circumcised in the past, but now you offer your faith to me. I demand it all. I demand you all, your life, your all. You offer yourself to the Lord. You offer yourself as a living sacrifice to the one who sacrificed his life for you. He demanded all. Or else, 
you'll be destroyed. Very simple as that. It's a matter of time, you will be punished and destroyed in hell forever. May the Lord give you the grace to believe and to obey, to accept the free gift of Jesus Christ. 20 to 25, real quick. But you, beloved, building yourself up in your most holy faith. You hear that? And praying in the, and praying in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourself in love of God, not the love of the world, love of your flesh, love of your, your sinful desires, the love of God, pure, waiting for the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life to complete your salvation. And have mercy on those who doubt, not unbelievers, but those who believe, but they doubt, they're not clear, they, they pull back and forth, and they do sincerely want to come commit to the Lord, have mercy on them, help them. How, do you, how can you help them? By go to join them and, and have a lewd life or a sinful life with them. No, 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 no. This is how you have mercy on them. You save them. Save others by, by how? By go and join them. No, snatch them out. Snatch them out out of the fire. Just like you drop something in a fire, you don't just go and say, ooh, let me all pick it up. And this become roasted. You snatch it out. The idea of a brand to burn and you want to save this brand, you snatch it out, you break it off quickly. Go like that. You do that to people who's in danger of hellfire. You snatch them out. To others, you show mercy with fear. You know that you have to go in with fear because it can take you as well. Some, be, some, some people, they do missionary dating. You know, evangelistic dating. <laughs> the date unbelievers, so the unbeliever may come a Christian, may bring him to church too, Pastor. I'm doing a good job, right? Yeah. Hating even the garment stained by the flesh, even that garment and that sinful nature, hate it, burn it. And now to him, not just for us people, for us a little secondary, primary. Have this in your mind before we take home today. Before we go home today, take this in your mind. Now to him, to God, not to people. To him who is able to keep you. He is the one who is able to keep us in this pure faith. From stumbling and to present you, us, blameless before the presence of this holy glory with great joy. To the only God, oh, I love this part. To the only God, our Savior. God is our Savior. Jesus our Savior, therefore make Jesus God. Amen. Through Jesus, God our Savior, save us through Jesus. Wow, not only he is a Savior, but he is an agent to save us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now we surrender ourselves to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. We don't just believe and be saved. We surrender and we follow this agent of God who saved us, the Lamb of God, the pure Lamb of God, the Son of God, which he demands our life, our soul, and our all. To them, to the Father, and to Jesus, both of them in one praise mean Jesus is equal to God. Be glory, majestic. Majesty, dominion, and authority to both of them. There's a deity of Jesus Christ loaded, people, before all time and now and forever. This eternal God, past, present, and future, will suffice, satisfy the demand of the Father in paying for our sin. Next time we'll see, and we all say, Amen. Pastor Dave, would you please...